All right, in John chapter 7, verse 27, uh, it says, but we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he's from. Uh, and the asterisk means that's where I stopped. Uh, and we'll see later that the crowd, uh, it could be different people, uh, but it's kind of the crowd is this a, a amorphous group of people uh, kind of opposed to Jesus. Uh, and they have a different message a bit later. In verse 28, uh, Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, he had gone there for the Feast of Tabernacles, but there he's in the, in the courts, uh, probably in one of the covered colonnades uh, where it gives shade. He cried out, yes, you know me, and you know where I'm from. But he says, I'm not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him. But I know him because I am from him and he sent me. Now, this was a reference to God the Father. And even though it is kind of uh, veiled or a vague reference, the people seem to understand what he was getting at there. Verse 30, at this they tried to seize him, uh, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. I'm not sure how the logistics worked there that they actually tried. They tried to seize him, but what, was he running away? Uh, and it, somehow it wasn't his time, uh, so it didn't happen. It was not yet time for him to be put on trial, uh, to be seized. But it, does, it shows an element of uh, antagonism developing here. And this chapter has a lot of that uh, opposition to Jesus. Uh, verse 31, still many in the crowd believed in him. Some, you know, said yay, and some said nay. Uh, they, they, the ones who believed, said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? Are we to expect anything greater? This is, this is, Great. Uh, this is uh, uh, awe-inspiring, the kind of good works that Jesus was doing. And it fit into at least some of their expectations of what the Messiah would do. They had different expectations of what a Messiah would be. Some, you know, most were looking for a military hero, but they are also expecting this military hero to be uh, accompanied with signs and miracles, much as Moses was uh, before he led the children of Israel out of Egypt. He was able to do miraculous things. And that helped give him authority uh, and respect uh, with the people. And this is what they were seeing in Jesus, too, that God must be working with him because, you know, nobody could do these things unless God were with him. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. So they wanted to uh, take action, but now we've already, John has just told us that it's not yet his hour, not yet his time. So we, we'll know how that goes. Uh, they will not be successful. Verse 33, Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and then I'm going to the one who sent me, uh, which they already know is God. You will look for me, but you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. Now, this is a bit of a riddle. Uh, Jesus is speaking uh, in a cryptic uh, fashion. So how, and, and even later, his own disciples wondered, well, how, where are you going? Uh, how, and why can't we go there? Here, Jesus is referring to uh, that he will be, un this is not like what they expected the Messiah to be. They wanted the Messiah to be one who was a very visible leader. And Jesus is saying he's going to not be able to be found. 
and he's going to be in a place where they can't go. And like, well, what kind of leader is this? Uh, this was a puzzle for them. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? I think there's a, a little irony here because the readers of the gospel will know that the gospel has gone to the Greeks, uh, that Jesus didn't go there in person, but he still the, he has reached the Greek-speaking peoples, and not just Greek-speaking Jews, but also the Gentiles as well. So they ask again, what, what did he mean when he said, you'll look for me, but you will not find me, and where I, I am, you cannot come. In a narrative like this, there seems to be some emphasis when a saying is repeated. Uh, so John is drawing attention to what Jesus has said here. He says, this is a puzzle, and the readers then will expect uh, John to give an answer to that puzzle later, I think, uh, when he, he repeats it, repeats the same words, uh, to give it some emphasis. Part of the gospel is, is designed to encourage thought among the readers. And that's part of the function of parables, too, that people can think about, oh, how does that apply? Uh, what, what does he mean there? And it, it could apply this way, it could apply that way, and it stimulates thought. Same here with this the riddle that Jesus has given. Well, what does he mean by that? We're going to have to, <clears throat> to stick around and listen to him some more to see what he means by that. Any comments from you on these things? Uh, Pastor Mike? Yes, Bernie. You know, you... You said something that made me think a little on, on why the Jews uh, struggled trying to understand this new Messiah, Jesus. You mentioned a while ago where, just like Moses, you said, you know, one who liberated the Israelites, who also did perform miracles. And when you mentioned that, I began to think about, yeah, Moses, who delivered Israel, and then there were judges, one after the other, all of the servants of God in their history have always been people who dealt with governments, who dealt with dictators, invaders. So mm -hmm. then even some prophets, I mean, even with Nehemiah. And I mean, it's, it's all of this. So therefore, I can't, you can't really blame them for thinking that this Messiah is going to do exactly the same to deliver them from human atrocities or governments. That's why they struggle because this, this new Messiah is totally talking about something different that cannot be grasped. It's, it's a new, it's a different kingdom, you know, spiritual kingdom. You know, that you just made me think, well, yeah, you know, all throughout history, Messiahs have been there to rescue or to liberate them from human governments or empires. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's, I was thinking of Elijah, who was confronting the king of Israel, uh, or and uh, Ahab. And yeah, they, they confronted, well, confronted leaders. Uh, here, Jesus is confronting the leaders of his own nation, uh, like Elijah did with the uh, uh, Ahab. But that wasn't what the, the Jewish people were expecting. They were thinking, well, the real enemy here is Rome. You know, those are the leaders he needs to be attacking. But Jesus had a uh, different understanding of the situation. And, well, the biggest uh, let's see, oppressor they had was uh, sin and guilt. And he dealt with that in a way that they didn't know they needed. And in doing, <laughs> attacking, uh, bringing forgiveness 
he was doing it outside of the temple system. So if he gives forgiveness in a different way, then that renders the temple rituals uh, unnecessary. And that, of course, uh, puts uh, it puts all these priests and Levites out of a job. So, and if if they knew where he was going, uh, they they might uh, be a little worried about that. But I, you know, I think there was issues of jealousy there too. But Jesus was drawing a crowd, uh, and there was some popular uh, discontent with the Jewish leaders anyway, because. They uh, were wealthy collaborators with the Romans, uh, and the high priest was appointed by the Romans. He would, uh, they, in fact, they would uh, pay money to the Roman procurator so that they could be appointed as high priest. It was no longer being uh, distributed or passed on by heredity. Uh, the way it was originally uh, re, you know, commanded in the laws of Moses. That was ever since the, uh, the Maccabean revolt. So it's, for several hundred years, there's this pattern of outside political leaders, uh, enemies, oppressors, occupiers, were appointing the Jewish high priests. And the, and the people didn't particularly like that. And that's what probably caused some of the Essenes to leave and uh, the, make the, the Dead Sea Scroll community. As far as they can piece together their history there, they have this te great tension with the illegitimate priests in Jerusalem. So the, the priests mm, had, knew that they people didn't really... Uh, uh, like them that much so they you know they'd have reason to be jealous of someone who uh quickly won a lot of public acclaim uh, and of course the jewish high priest couldn't do any miracles so they couldn't uh you know that that would uh, be disconcerting for them as well so their answer to it was let's arrest him uh go get him uh you know that's what they did with john the baptist uh Herod Antipas didn't like what John the Baptist was preaching, so he put him in prison. Now that, uh, well, that worked for a while. <laughs> Anyone else? Mike, um, yes, did you say, thank you. Uh, did you say that you're going to tell us about the riddle? <laughs> like, because I want to know what he meant by that. Where <laughs> I am, you cannot come. Because I would think he would say, you'll come soon. Or, you know, because he's going to the Father, right? I'm going to back to the one who sent me. Right. So he, he's going into the grave and he's going to the Father. And, and we cannot go to the Father the way that he does. Now, when we die, we go to be with Jesus. Uh, but that's it, it's not quite the same uh, as what he's implying there. And then when he when he after his resurrection, when he tells Philip, you know, where I'm going, at, you know, is it before or after? I forget. Uh, anyway, it's in it's in this book. We'll have to read it, keep reading and, and find out. Uh, yeah, Philip wonders, well, how, how, how can he just go and we can't go? Yeah, how, how is it that we're not able to go? He, Jesus is, yeah, speaking of yeah, his, his resurrection, uh, and in some ways, yeah, we go to be with Jesus, uh, the Lord, as Paul said, uh, but certain, not in the same manner, uh, the same status that Jesus had. So we're not completely with him in that sense. So okay. it, it's, yeah, it, it is, it's a bit of a puzzle because in some ways, yes, we do follow Jesus uh, and he, he makes sure of that. Okay, that's that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's, and I I guess John doesn't really, I, I you know sometimes he explains the riddles. Um, he'll he'll have a little parenthetical uh, comment there. It says by this Jesus meant his resurrection. I don't remember whether he does that uh, for uh, Philip's question. But that's seems to be what he's referring to. All right. Um, 
Yes, uh, so answer. Like, I like uh, how John writes the thing in you know verse thirty two. The the priests are sending the temple guards to arrest him, and Jesus says, "Where uh, you where I go, you cannot come. You cannot <laughs> follow me." <laughs> so he preempts them. Oh, yeah. you're trying to arrest me? Okay, you're going to arrest me, huh? Well, where I will go, you cannot come. <laughs> uh, yeah that's that is an interesting one they're looking for him to arrest him but no they can't get there <laughs> no way jose uh, well, so so therefore it really shows that jesus was in total control of what is happening he knows what, where he's going to the cross he knows about the proper timing, so he doesn't let things go out of control. But when it's yeah. time, he will allow it. Yeah. Right. You're at the even even in the crucifixion, Jesus takes initiative in several of those uh, interchanges, and he takes command. He says, you know, tells John, you know, John, you know, behold your mother, and he's taking take telling him to take care of Mary. He is in control even when he's on the cross. He knows what he's doing, where he's going, when it's going to happen. Yeah, he is definitely uh, in charge. Even though he looks like a victim, he's in charge. He says, you would have no power over me unless the Father had given it to you. you know, it's, <laughs> he, he knew where the authority was. Amen. Okay, uh, let's look at verse 37. Next uh, little story there. On the last and greatest day of the festival, uh, scholars aren't quite sure which day that is. The festival lasted seven days, and on the eighth day was also a festival, and they were sometimes all lumped together and as part of the same Feast of Tabernacles. So... He's either on the seventh day or the eighth day. And the symbolism works either way. The Jewish priests had a water pouring ritual as part of the Festival of Tabernacle celebrations. They would go down to the Pool of Siloam and draw water and bring it up to the temple and pour it out as part of their ceremony. Some will say this was a you know, a prayer for good rainfall for the coming uh, agricultural season. Jesus is going to use it as a spiritual, uh, pointing for, toward something spiritual. Now, I on the screen, I show you two different versions of this, what he's saying here. And the translators will say uh, the... Uh, I think it's, yeah, the NIV says this on the left, but a footnote says the one on the right. And the question then is, out of, out of whom are these rivers of living water flowing? Are they flowing from Jesus or are they flowing from his believers? And the Greek words could be understood either way. And theologically, both of them make sense as well. So kind of the translator's question is, well, which one did Jesus most likely mean? Well, here the NIV has chosen the one on the left. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And the other option is that the river of rivers of living water simply flow from Jesus. In John 4, Jesus had told the Samaritan woman that water that he gave her, that he could give her water to drink and living waters would flow up from within her. So if there's an, uh, a situation in which living waters flow from believers as well as from Jesus. So both of these are true. And I, I suspect sometimes, maybe here, John likes to leave it open to different interpretations because both are true. Uh, 
sometimes I write things that uh, yeah can be understood in either way. And if I don't mean the other way, I try to fix it. Uh, but if I say, oh, okay, well, either way will work, uh, I can I can let it stay. Perhaps that's what John is doing here. He is creating something that's uh, maybe again thought provoking that would reader would think. Well, I wonder what she means by that. Uh, could it be this? Yeah, that could work. Could it mean that? Oh, yeah, that could work too. Uh, and he's encouraged people to think about it. John uses plays on words a few times, more often than the other writers do, I think. Uh, we saw that. Our uh, best example is in John 3, where he says, you must be born. And he uses a word that can mean either from above or again. And, and Nicodemus takes it one way. Jesus explains it the other way. And both ways work. Uh, if you're going to be born from above, it's going to be again as well. Uh, translators, well, yeah, they, they, they have to pick the one. They, they pick the one that helps make sense of how Nicodemus responded. And Nicodemus responds as if he's meaning again. And so that's the way it's generally translated, even though they footnote that it can also mean uh, from above. Here, Jesus is saying, the priests are pouring water. Uh, Jesus says, hey, that's, that's just a drop in the bucket. I'm talking about rivers of living water, not just ordinary water, uh, rivers of living water. Even the living water is a play on words because the living water normally meant water that was flowing, uh, active water, not as opposed to stagnant pools, lakes, uh, or a cistern would have stagnant water. It is, it's not moving. It's not living. Uh, so, But a stream has living water. But as we see in the book of John, he's talking more, not just moving water, but water that brings life. It's living in a far greater, a more significant sense. And that's what he's saying here, that, that rivers uh, of life-giving water will flow from those who believe. And we would like that <laughs> to be true in our own lives, too, that we would hope that uh, our faith in Jesus helps other people come to faith as well and is a, a life giving uh, uh, that our lives give life to others instead of being a damper on them of uh, pulling them down we want to uh, lift them up because of the work of Jesus in us any thoughts there as to uh, the living waters flowing from within us Well, verse 39, John does explain this one. He says, by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. This is a bit of a theological puzzle for people, too. Uh, we see the Spirit being given to people in the Old Testament. Uh, so in, at least in some sense, the Spirit was given to them, whether for performing you know, the judges, uh, the Spirit came upon them and they did mighty deeds, or in the building of the tabernacle, God gave his Spirit to uh, one, of the, one of the people there, and he was a craftsman who could make these wonderful decorations for the tabernacle. And... And this is Psalm 51, for example, David is saying, do not take your spirit from me. He had the spirit. The spirit had been given to him. So some of the people in the Old Testament had the spirit. So the puzzle for the theologians is to what does it mean here uh, that when Jesus says, or John is saying here as a word of explanation, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been yet been glorified. Most of them seem to uh, 
choose some kind of level uh, that perhaps the Old Testament personalities were the spirit came upon them and not in them, uh, or came upon the spirit came upon them for a specific task, but did not remain in them for life, uh, or a different quality of uh, some of the examples I gave were for people doing physical exploits. And John is talking about and Jesus is giving us a spiritual uh, transformation through the Spirit. So this is a, a little puzzle there that uh, John uh, does not <laughs> does not explain later. Uh, I don't know if it was meant to be a riddle. It, it, it reads like as if this is an explanation, but it creates questions as well as explaining the comment of Jesus. Uh, any comments from you on that? Pastor Mike? Yes. Um, it is, is it possible that, you know, the previous verse, the context is about people believing. It's about faith and belief that's when the living waters come and in the old testament as you mentioned probably it's not about their belief or their faith but it's some kind of a ministry that god can work through them but not in them you know the verse 39 you know it's the belief maybe it's connected with that it's more spiritual mm -hmm. in nature more of a salvific kind of act I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I think you're you're have a good insight there to connect it with that that sentence there. Those who believed in him, uh, that does seem to be uh, what he's referring to. Uh, I I think I I've seen it too where uh, they will say in the Old Testament it was just given to isolated individuals. And the New Testament is given to a much larger group of people. Uh, that isn't quite what uh, this verse says. That uh, yeah, so we we struggle to uh, know what the difference is between Old Testament believers and New Testament believers. We. Uh, we, we see in Hebrews 11 that they are all examples of faith. We as, assume that they are saved uh, and that they, yeah, that they responded because the Spirit moved them to. Someone else was going to say something? Oh, yes, Pastor Mike. I just remember the pastor or oh, somebody told me that uh, during the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit rested on them, but it's not inside them, like the one in the New Testament where it's a union and communion with Jesus' spirit. Uh, it's a, you know, union and communion when he promised the advocate to come with us, uh, like dining in us. So the the explanation was it, it was just resting on them, yeah. some sort of a peripheral, you know. Yeah, uh, maybe temporary. Temporary, yeah. So I don't know if, that's, if that understanding is still uh, uh, <laughs> valid or... It was just an interpretation. Well, yeah, I, I guess they're all interpretations. Uh, that's, I, I don't know that there's a consensus as to what uh, John means here. Uh, many of those explanations have support in other ways, uh, but just John has stated it so like black and white here uh, that it makes it hard for us to say, oh, how is that? You know, yeah, we, we don't see the reality as black and white as John does. Mm -hmm. Okay. Verse 40. Upon hearing, on hearing his word, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. <clears throat> Referring to a prophet that Moses had predicted in Deuteronomy. Uh, so it's kind of a, another name for a, a spiritual leader, but like others said, he is the Messiah, as if there are two different kinds there. 
Some Jews did expect two kinds of Messiah, uh, one a kingly Messiah, one a priestly Messiah. Uh, and they, because in the nation of Israel, the priests and the kings were of different tribes. It's like they had a division of power uh, to prevent uh, uh, excesses. So they kind of expected that to continue, that there would be a, a Messiah in the line of David, and there would be a, a Messiah in the line of Levi. I'm not sure whether this verse 40, 41, uh, referring to those two kinds of Messiah, that's one possibility. But they seem to make, be making some kind of distinction between predicted leaders, predicted uh, figures. One's a prophet, one's a messiah. Different roles. Uh, they and, I, and they they speak about some of the roles of Jesus in ways that uh, are a little puzzling. So like, and some of the other gospels will say, "Oh, he is Elijah." Uh, it's like he is in the line of Elijah, and some people, and the way it's phrased in some ways, it sounds like, oh, John the Baptist, is actually Elijah come back to life? Or is he just in the role, the prophetic role that Elijah epitomizes? Well, there were lots of speculations about the Messiah. And in some ways, there was more speculation about the Messianic age than there was about the Messiah. People were interested in the Messianic age. They were not quite sure what kind of leader would bring that about. So yeah, they, they had these uh, different ideas shown in different old, uh, old Jewish writings. So, and, and we can see a little bit of that reflected here. Some people were speculating, what could he be? Where is he from? We don't know. You know, what, what's he going to be doing? Well, we don't know. Maybe it's this, and maybe he is this. Uh, verse 41 again. Still others ask, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Well, uh, we know he's from Galilee. Does not Scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? And I suspect that John's readers knew that Jesus was actually from Bethlehem. So they're getting in on the on the joke there. So, oh, those people, they didn't know. Uh, they thought they knew where he was from, but they were wrong. They uh, didn't know the whole story. So that's uh, filling in a gap there. Verse 43, the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. They were, it explains in one place, the leaders didn't want to do it publicly because, because Jesus did have a big following. It would cause a big stir. Uh, they wanted to do it secretly. Any comments? Uh, Pastor Mike. Uh, yes, sir. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you mentioned, the messi messianic aids? You said that they were expecting this prophet or messiah because they're thinking of the messianic aids uh, what is that messianic aids in their mind ah uh, one one that comes to mind is that they they said the, the messianic age would last 400 years and each uh each vine would have 10,000 clusters of grapes and each uh, grape in that cluster would have 10 gallons of uh, wine in the grape. And uh, they were talking about an extravagant uh, uh, abundance. Uh, they would have similar kinds of abundance for uh, wheat and olive, uh, olive oil. Uh, the, the, the grapes uh, was the most uh, uh, striking speculation. <laughs> enormous grapes. Uh, each cluster would have 10,000 grapes. It's just over-the-top uh, mathematics. 
so they were looking for an age of abundance uh, on this earth, but kind of in still in the uh, stream of history that they had seen before. They were uh, expecting someone to come from uh, from God, yes, but they were still looking, they were expecting the Messiah to be a human. They did not expect God himself to be the Messiah. So yeah, you, Moses was a human. They, they would expect him, and they expected uh, everyone to have a long life. Isaiah talked about, uh, you know, people that die at a age 100, say, oh, that's, oh, he died so young, uh, because everybody would live such long lives. But they would still die. Uh, you know, we are looking forward to something even better than their speculations of abundance and blessing. So that, that's at least some of the things they were looking forward to. You know, we can read the uh, prophets, Isaiah, Micah, and others, and see this described a wonderful time to come. And I compare it to, uh, you know, we used to have a, uh, you know, a, a film uh, describing the millennium, and we'd see a child playing with a lion. Uh, but, you know, wait, where was the fig tree? Uh, you know, because Isaiah predicted a fig tree, too. Each of these are kind of snapshots and a represented, representative, not prescriptive for everybody. It's not that everybody will have a vine and a fig tree uh, and just be sitting under it all the time. Not every child will play with a lion, but these are the kinds of things that will be happening. That, and in other climates, other regions, they'll have different kinds of trees, different kinds of fruits. So we can think of these prophecies as uh, just representative samples. And we think imaginatively about what that picture is, uh, what, what it's picturing, uh, what's really going on there. This is a picture of abundance, of peace, of, of being spiritually in tune with God where people are receptive to what he is teaching instead of resisting it. So these are the kinds of descriptions that we see in the prophets, and we can maybe extrapolate, uh, maybe make a few guesses uh, about what it will look like in other situations and places. Uh, you know, will, will we have more rain? I don't know that they speculated so much about that. They said we would have rain in due season. Was it more uh, just or just reliable? What were they looking for? Uh, they're probably looking for reliability. I'm not sure that they, uh, that they had no experience with tropical jungles, for example, <clears throat> to know what uh, other places might be like. So when we look at those same prophecies, we too, we need to read them with a uh, a, a little bit of imagination uh, as to what it could be picturing and pointing toward uh, rather than just frozen as this is exactly the way it's going to be for every person every time. Well, I, I, think, yeah. I digress. Thank, <laughs> thank, you, thank you. I mean, so, you know, sorry, I, I asked a lot of questions. <laughs> so we are saying that um, this, this Jews... We're expecting a Messiah, one, to overthrow the Roman Empire so that they can have peace. But then also they expect a Messiah to bring about this wonderful world, but no human can do. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> they, so they didn't think about that, right? Right. right. They, they didn't seem to recognize the uh, weakness of humanity. I mean, we can go back to Genesis and, you know, read that story there and say that this is describing uh, what's happened all along, all throughout history. People have disobeyed what God has said. They've cut themselves off from him and so forth. Some have said that Paul had, uh, the Apostle Paul, 
had a very positive view of human ability before his conversion. Now, he, he, according to the law, he was blameless. He kept it all. He was proud of that. But after his conversion, he realized that uh, everyone has sinned. All have fallen short. Uh, even the best person falls short. So then they said, well, okay, then he had a pessimistic view of humanity. How did, how did he get that? Say they, they call it thinking backwards. If God provided a Messiah who died, if God allowed his Messiah to be killed, well, that was the solution to the problem. The problem must have been a lot deeper than we realized. Uh, and that's then we can think, well, what was the problem? What was the problem with humanity? And why couldn't, say, temple sacrifices solve the problem? Why had Israel been able, unable to solve the problem despite all their insistence on keeping the rules? Uh, why were they still being ruled by Gentile nations? Well, because they were still being ruled inside by Gentile uh, tendencies. <laughs> we, we have evil within us that we, that we need Jesus to uh, deal with. So yeah, there was a, a transformation and an understanding of human ability. And that happens later in church history too. Uh, Augustine dealt with the, a group called the Donatists uh, who were followers of some uh, a guy named Donatus. Uh, but he, he was saying, or Pelagius, uh, uh, two different controversies, sorry, Pelagius. Pelagius is the one who said, if humans just try really hard, they'll be able to do everything Jesus said. Uh, Augustine said, no, it's not going to work. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, we were not able to do it. Uh, we remain uh, sinners at the same time that we are forgiven. Uh, simultaneously, uh, sinners and uh, justified is his phrase. Uh, mm, I've forgotten how I got there. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll go back to the temple courts where people were trying to seize Jesus, but no one laid a hand on him. And then we have verse 45. Finally, the temple guards who had been sent to arrest Jesus, they went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? Uh, like, well, uh, they answered, no one ever spoke the way this man does. The guards replied, it's like, this is an extraordinary teacher. Verse 47, you mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. The, these religious leaders had a pretty poor attitude toward the common people there. They think, well, you know, you're not keeping all of our rules. You're, there's a curse on you. Uh, you're, you're rubble. We, you know, it's yeah. God's not going to want you. And we can see that attitude reflected in some of the other, uh, the way they interacted with people in a few other places too, accusing Jesus of, uh, you know, hanging around sinners, and, uh, that sort of thing. Here they, the Pharisees. I mean, if they really wanted to arrest Jesus, they should have gone and done it themselves. But they were afraid of the people. Uh, they sent somebody else to do it, and uh, these guards were astonished at what Jesus was teaching. Uh, and in a favorable way, apparently, that they said, well, we don't want to arrest this person who's 
teaching us uh, about God. It's like, you know, they, they didn't just follow orders. They were, I don't know, yeah. It's, John doesn't explain what all went in their, through their heads as to why they did not go through with what they were sent to do. But anyway, the Pharisees who sent them were uh, were uh, upset about that. And they'll try again later, of course, as we know. Now, Nicodemus returns to the story briefly. Uh, verse 50, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, he was also a Pharisee, he asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? So he was kind of asking a procedural question, uh, but seems to have, uh, with some favor toward Jesus, he didn't quite think they should be arresting him right right just then. Uh, they, don't need, they need to go find out what he's been teaching, which I think makes good sense. But uh, they... Uh. Verse 52, the other Pharisees didn't really like that. They had their mind up to, make, you know, we want to get rid of Jesus. We don't, we've we've already heard enough. We don't want to hear more. Uh, they, they replied, are you from Galilee too? Like, oh, all those Galileans are uh, lower intelligence. <laughs> Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Well, that was wrong. <laughs> uh, apparently, Jonah was from Galilee. Uh, so at least one prophet was from there. And some of the manuscripts do say, do alter it to say, and you'll find out that the prophet does not come out of Galilee. Well, he comes out of Bethlehem, or I'm not sure how they would have distinguished between the prophet and the Messiah. Uh, the scriptures don't say enough about the prophet that Moses predicted to help us know where he would have come from. Some of the New Testament describes uh, Jesus being from Nazareth, as a fulfillment of scripture. There's no particular scripture that says, that mentions Nazareth. Apparently Nazareth as a village didn't even exist back in Old Testament times. But it seems to be a play on words uh, with the word Nazar, uh, which means branch. And that's a word that some of the prophets use to describe the Messiah that a branch will come out of the root of Jesse. And that would have been associated with Messiah. So they use this Netzer uh, combined with uh, someone who is from Na uh, Nazareth uh, and similar sounding words to say that, you know, that, that's connected with those scriptures. The Pharisees would not have... Uh, used that kind of uh, belief that it didn't apparently didn't exist until Jesus came along and people then could after the fact look back and say oh Jesus was born in Nazareth and that goes back to the scriptures about the Netzer branch coming out of the root of Jesse so they could make those connections after the fact, but it wasn't a clear enough prophecy that they could have looked forward and say, ah, yes, the Messiah will be from this village of Nazareth. Here they were just dismissing Nicodemus. Nicodemus turns up in the story later as also, again, a sympathizer with Jesus. Not quite sure whether he's a believer, but he's... Uh, certainly uh, sympathetic to what Jesus is doing and saying. Any comments? All right, we'll go forward and we'll come to a 
little note in the NIV text that tells us the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses, uh, which we might mean lectionaries, uh, do not have verses from John 53 to 8 through 811. And this is the story of the woman caught in adultery. <laughs> a few manuscripts include these verses, holy or in part, after John, uh, John 7, John 21, even or Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke. So they've put this story and placed it in and put it in different places. The oldest manuscripts don't have it at all. And it, it gives translators a, mm, a, a difficult job. Okay, what do we do with this? Uh, this is a well-known story. The earliest church didn't seem to have it. Or we have no evidence that the earliest church did, but we have it now. How did it come to be there? Mm, well, we're not quite sure. But the early church did accept this as a story, an authentic story about what Jesus did. And, well, this we see it here in uh, mostly John 8. It could have been in other places, too. In John 8, it seems to interrupt the flow of the story. Like Jesus says, at the Feast of Tabernacles in John 7, after the story, he is again in the temple at the Feast of Tabernacles. So this is uh, could be removed and the story flow nicely without it. But most, most of the uh, scholars say, well, this must have been a, an authentic story about Jesus that circulated independently and scribes eventually put it in a place where they thought it fit. Uh, so we can still use it. Uh, it's an edifying story. It's an encouraging story. It tells us something about who Jesus is and uh, you know how we are to respond to him. So we can we we read it uh, you know as an independent story about Jesus. Verse starts 53, they all went home. Uh, so he is, uh, you know, af after dismissing Nicodemus, uh, well, they didn't get what they wanted, so they all went home. But Jesus, verse chapter 8, went to the Mount of Olives, which apparently that's where he uh, spent the night when he was at the festivals whether it may have been in the home of uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He did have some friends uh, and Bethany on the other, uh, other, other uh, slope of the Mount of Olives. At dawn, uh, he appeared again in the temple courts. Uh, would have had to walk uh, into the city before, well, before it was uh, dawn. So, uh, but it's full moon, so he could uh, walk there easily enough, I guess. So at dawn, he was the, again there, and lots of other people were too, and where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. That's the position of a teacher sitting. Probably from when the teachers all used to be old, uh, and they needed to sit. And they didn't have a lot of chairs. So only... Only uh, only the special person got to sit down, and that was the teacher. That was the uh, accepted uh, posture for a teacher. Nowadays, it's kind of the reverse. All the students sit down, and the teacher stands up. Here, he sat down to teach them. But the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Ah. Uh, they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Uh, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Of course, if they, she was caught in adultery, uh, well, well, where was the man? They didn't bring in the man, uh, contrary to the law of Moses. Moses said the man, too, uh, should have the same penalty. So they were uh, not 
administering the law of Moses fairly. They had some suggest that they contrived this situation to test Jesus or whether it just happened. Uh, either way, they brought the woman to Jesus to test him. And the trap here is that he would either be, uh, on one side, he would be accused of ignoring the law of Moses, not uh, adhering to what it said. On the other side, he would be accused of uh, encouraging the Jews to administer the death penalty, which was contrary to the Roman law. So, so yeah, and comparable to some of the other tests that they put Jesus to. He would be uh, in one problem if he answered one way, one problem if he answered the other way. So he doesn't answer it. <laughs> That's how he gets out of it. He uh, gives them a more difficult question. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And there's been lots of speculations about that. <laughs> but John doesn't tell us. No, and or, you know, the story does not tell us what he wrote. Uh, this is the only uh, uh, time that we actually know that Jesus knew how to write. Jesus didn't write any books for us, but he wrote on the ground with his finger. What was he writing? Was he writing the law of Moses where it said, you know, you're supposed to bring in the, both the man and the woman? Uh, maybe he did that. Maybe he was writing down their names in the times when they committed adultery themselves. Well, we don't know. But he's diverting the question. Uh, verse 7, when they kept on questioning him, uh, so whatever he was writing didn't really put them to silence. Uh, they kept on questioning him. They, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin. Doesn't have to be the same kind of sin even, uh, but be the first to throw a stone at her. And the one man who could have done that, he it was Jesus. He was the one without sin, but... He did not throw a stone. Uh, he he just stooped down and wrote on the ground, waiting waiting his time. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. So the oldest ones realized that they were not without sin. So they couldn't pick up stones to start it. And uh, they, they didn't even stick around to see if anybody else would do it. They went ahead and left. Uh, again, be, it'd be interesting to know what was in their minds. How, what their reasoning was. Uh, hmm. So only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Well, of course, Jesus knew the answer. <laughs> but she answers, No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Or sin no more. Uh, your life of sin implies an ongoing thing. I'm not sure that the Greek implies that much. Uh, it could have been a one-time thing. We don't know. His point is that she, sh that what she had done, adultery, is indeed a sin, and she shouldn't be doing it. But Jesus is not going to condemn her, condemn her uh, in terms of uh, the death penalty, which is the specific situation they asked about. Uh, well, I see I'm out of time, uh, but maybe, I don't know, seems like we could have lots of comments on this story. Uh, so maybe you could, uh, what, what do you think?
Thank you. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next week. <laughs> we look forward to it. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks to all of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was really wonderful. All right. Good night. Yeah. See, stop Good night. Recording.